or our goal in these couple of hours is to sort of bring you a very stress free election preview show. We want to just slow things down a little bit and really sink into a couple of very important topics. One of them is polling. How exactly does it work? How reliable is it? Our Tim Blotz uh, is with political analyst David Schultz. Tim, <laughs> uh, I know this is a topic near and dear to David's heart. It yes, really it is. is. Yeah, yeah. It seems like there have been a new poll every other day for the yes. past uh, few months now. So we want to pull back the curtain a little bit and talk about how they're conducted and how reliable they are too. Mm -hmm. So let's start, David, with how they're conducted. Okay. Because the methodology has really changed now in the last really 10 to 15 years. Yeah, you're correct. If we went back 10 or 15 years ago, this was all done by landline, you know, basically the old yep. fashioned phones calling people at home. Um, and then it shifted gradually to being, let's say some cell phone, but now it's a combination of a whole bunch of different methods at this point. Some cell phone, a little bit of landline, some of it, and some pollsters may be doing things like in terms of um, online. So a lot of different techniques, but this is very important to think about here. Mm -hmm. Because if you think about what we want in a good poll, at the end of the day, we want to have as best as possible a snapshot of what we think the electorate, those who are going to show up, what they're actually going to do. So it's kind of like a mini version of who shows up on election day. So we have to come up with a lot of ways of finding these individuals. And it's getting harder and harder because those of us who are consumers, especially with our cell phones, right. are getting more sophisticated in recognizing a robocall or a number that we don't recognize and therefore we just, we don't answer. Yeah, I was gonna say, that's gonna be a special, it's across the board true. One of the things I'm gonna try to argue today too is that among the groups that's really, really hard to poll, especially are those under the age of 30. And what we, the reason why I mention that is that these, both for, in terms of reaching and figuring mm -hmm. out if they are a likely voter is gonna be hard. And if the polls don't quite have that right, and I have a hypothesis that they're not quite capturing those under 30 mm. voters, um, that could be pretty significant. I don't want to sort of invoke a stereotype, yeah, but I'll right. do it here. But for every parent who has said, for example, I text my kid and I don't hear back from them. <laughs> uh, uh, that's sort of what we're talking a little bit about right. here in terms of how do you reach those 18 to 30 year olds? So that brings up the question of reliability here. How reliable are these polls that we're seeing? Well, actually, I'm going to be one of those few people who defend the polls and mm -hmm. say that the pollsters have figured out how to do this and have actually gotten pretty good. Back in 2016, um, the national polls were actually correct in saying Clinton was going to win the, the popular vote, and she did, um, and, and about, about how much she was going to win it by. Even at the state polls, if you looked at them, they were tracking correctly. Okay. But one of the two points I want to make sure people understand right now, first of all, for all the polls that you see about national public opinion, mm -hmm. ignore every one because we don't elect the president by national popular Ain't vote. That the truth. So we don't care. But the second thing is to keep in mind here is that all polls are going to say, let's say somebody's ahead 45, 44, or yeah. something like that, with what's called a margin of error. And the margins of errors are determined by how big the sample. And if you got somebody who supposedly had, let's say, by one or two points, mm -hmm. but the margin of error is like three or four points, we can't infer that right, much at all right. from it. So let's use this as an example. Right. This is one of the latest polls that came out very late last week from the Harris Corporation, very well known, okay. established pollsting, right. pollster organization over the years. And it showed essentially Kamala up by two points here. Right. Right? Okay, now. Here was the sample size, yeah, 4,500 people, which is pretty good. It's a right? very large sample That's size. It's a very large sample size, and that margin of error is very low, one and a half percent. It's very rare to see a margin of error this low, yeah. right? Right. Yeah. And what they use as their methodology is an opt-in web panel here. Mm -hmm. Explain that. Well, what it is going to be at this point, they're looking for people to, um, they're basically putting out a broadcast in terms of trying to find people and getting people to opt in, to opt to select to basically to do the survey. Got it. Yeah. Um, there could be a little bit of selection bias in terms of it, mm -hmm. but pollsters are trying to figure that out, trying to figure out how to compensate for that. And they can do that by looking at past results and trying to make some minor adjustments. But in a poll like this, again, with 
but 40, four and a half thousand people, margin of error 1.5%, pretty good. But still, think about what we have here. This is saying 47.45. She could actually be at what, 48.5? or it could be what? Essentially dead even with the yeah. margin of error 1.5. Let's look at another poll. Okay, this one from Atlas Intel. Again, this one came out last week too, and this one shows Trump up by essentially two points, all right? And the sample size here is about 900 people smaller. All right. Around. Again, a digital sample. That's here, right. But the margin of error is bigger. That's right, that's right. So again, looking the same thing here, Trump could be up to 51, he could be, Harris could actually be in the lead on this one. And that's important to think about here yeah. in terms of that margin of, of error, that, that partly what we're also getting besides sample size that affects a poll. Again, first remember, polls are not predictors, they're snapshots in time. They tell us what's gonna happen at a particular time. Yeah. They're not supposed to be predictive. But the other thing that's important to think about with these polls mm -hmm. is that what I wanna know as a pollster is who's likely to vote. Mm -hmm. I don't want to just talk to anybody. What if I talk to a whole bunch of people who are not registered to vote? It doesn't, it matter. doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. So part of where they make their money is figuring out who is likely to vote. And they're, and they're not just going to ask people, are you going to vote? Because I hate to say it, we're all going to lie. We're all going to say we're going to vote. Because uh, that's the right answer to give. Sure. They're going to ask a whole series of questions to figure that out. So some of the difference here is sample size. Some of it may be in terms of how they determined who's likely to vote. Now, the other thing I love about this Atlas yeah. poll is they're very upfront. Yes. Before you get to the top lines of the poll, that is the results, right. they list who they talk to. Yes. All right? And I, I respect this Yes. Uh, if, from a, a major pollster. They talk to 51% um, women, 47% men, and then they will wait. So yeah. they'll assign a mathematic score That's to right. those to try and bring them up to match the general population. You're absolutely correct here. Now we know that, uh, just to give you an idea here, about 53, 54% of the electorate now is female. Mm -hmm. This poll came in a little bit shy on it, so they wanna compensate for it. But what's really good about this, this underscores a point that I made before. I want a, a, a poll that is a snapshot, a microcosm of what the electorate looks like. Yeah. Do we think that variables or factors such as, as race or income or education. ethnicity, education. Education is one of the big ones now, yeah. that the presence of a college degree or not having it is significant. So you want to be looking at that poll in terms of it. Now, if I look at it here, college degree or higher, um, that may be a little bit high compared yeah, to- 43% Yeah, here. a little bit high compared to what we know for, the nat, for, our, for, for what the United States actually is. But given the fact that college people are more likely to vote than those yeah. without college degree, that, that might be fair. I want to talk next about something that, that you caution voters about and consumers about, and that is polling averages. Yes. Now, there's one website in particular, Real Clear Politics, that does an average like this. That's right. In fact, the latest average showed it at a dead heat, right? Yeah, right. What's wrong with this? There's a variety of things wrong with it. One of them, these are polls taking at different times and averaging them together is a problem. The other problem is, is again, they're asking different questions about who's likely voters. And different methodologies and different, and different exactly, people that they're exactly, talking that's to. Right, that's right. If, for example, all these polls were talking to the same people, doing the same methodology, it would be okay. I don't want to quite say this is the proverbial putting together apples and oranges. But if that helps, this is putting together the apples and oranges here. Now, another one to perhaps look at, if you want to look at an average poll, this is the New York Times, this right. is their tracking poll, right? right? So, and this is the latest tracking poll for them, showed Harris, uh, again, almost equal, 49 right. to 48%. Yeah. But you can see the trend lines in, in their polls over the past couple of months yeah. because they're using the same questions and the same methodology every time. Yeah, and this is probably a better way of doing it. Again, assuming they're actually identifying, again, the likely voters. Mm -hmm. But notice something also about this poll, by the way. And I like this trend line here. Okay, back here in August, this is about a point here where yeah. Biden's exiting, Harris is coming in and so forth like yeah. that. But what you can draw on this, David, yeah. if you want. Okay. okay. So if we get to a point here around the De Republic, uh, Republican National Convention here, we get a little bit closer to here to Democratic National Convention here. We get some spread, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. But notice the longer trend. Okay. We're not looking at much divergence. And part of, one of the things I want to point out to people, what has struck me about this election, so interesting. Mm -hmm. If we would go back two years ago, two years ago, and you were to say to me, 
who's the likely candidates? I'd say Trump versus Biden. Look at the polls back then. Nationally, they were almost in a dead heat, and the swing states were almost identical in terms of right. where they were. Right. Now, two years later, where are we? The same thing. Public opinion has not shifted that much. A small amount of gyration here, but over a two-year period, incredible stability in the polls. Mm -hmm. All right, and then I want us to talk about the Tom Bradley effect. Yes. Okay, this is a phenomenon in polling that goes back to 1982 when longtime Los Angeles Mayor Tom Bradley was running for governor of California. Correct. All the polls, all the polls showed him so far up in mm -hmm. this race. And then election day happened and he lost. Yes. So explain to us the theory here. Okay, the theory was that people did not want to say, and, and as we can see, uh, Bradley is African-American. And people mm -hmm. were saying that a lot of people were not going to say, I'm not gonna vote for somebody who's African-American. Um, and so they weren't being truthful with the pollster, they were lying. And so what some people are saying is that, do we have a Bradley effect out here? Mm -hmm. Are, for example, some people are saying, are some people, let us say, shy, vote, shy Trump supporters at this point? There's a little bit of evidence of that maybe in 2016, mm -hmm. but again, pollsters think they've compensated for that. In fact, some pollsters are saying they've overcompensated for that. And so maybe, again, we don't know, yeah. maybe um, they're counting Trump support a little heavier so they don't err. All right, and coming up in our next half hour, why we may not know the revote totals yet tonight, and this will be a great discussion as well coming yep. up at 345 here. Amy? All right.